All right, guys, so you all know that um, I'm your instructor and my name is Arkady Etkin. And uh, I sent you a link to the syllabus. I would not like to discuss the syllabus during this class just because I tend to, in online settings, to take too much time. And as the semester comes to an end, uh, we have to rush through the material. So I would try to cut as much uh, as possible, which is not necessary. Uh, to uh, to office hours, perhaps, right? So if you have questions about the syllabus, you can read it, you can talk to me afterwards. You all received the link to it. Let me just show you uh, my website, okay? So this is my website. It is aetkin.com. Here it is, aetkin.com. And uh, on this website, you find uh, different classes that I have taught. Syllabus, uh, I post under a separate link. So the syllabus is posted uh, here. You can press on syllabi and you can select the semester. And that's our syllabus. Uh, the exam is based, uh, well, the, the grade, I'm sorry, is based on uh, two exams and a final. Those are take home exams because we tend to not have time to do them in class. I tend to speak way too much. So it's not very difficult to survive this class. I hope that you are more inspired to not survive the class and not to get some grade that matters, not, but to actually understand this material, to actually think as a, well, to think in terms of probability, good? So that's as much as this class uh, is concerned. And now we might perhaps right away begin with an appetizer for this course. That's where I post uh, all my notes, by the way. So here, uh, just a, a short appetizer, guys. So probability is on one hand, extremely simple. It's as simple as counting on your fingers. The problem is that uh, counting on your fingers is less simple than you might have been brought to believe. So when people tell you something is elementary, well, elementary, yes, elementary just means it's an atom, but atoms are very difficult to understand. Yes, so, and when you apply probability to the analysis of data, what do you get? Well, you get, if you apply properly, you get significant results. You get meaningful results. You get results that cannot be disputed. The problem is you do not know what is it that cannot be disputed. You know this cannot be disputed, but not what cannot be disputed. Do you understand? And so like mathematics in general, it reminds me, or well, probability reminds me, of this poem by Alexander Bloch. I might not be able to read it too well because the poem is Russian and it's beautiful in Russian. And in English, uh, it's like swallowing fish bones. But nonetheless, I will try to read it and see if I am successful. Behind me, you must go behind me, my slave, obedient and true. The sparkling mountain ridges find me in flight and flattering with you. Above abysses I shall take you, bottomless pits of mystery. And there, while futile terrors shake you, is inspiration's strength for me. Amid the ether's flaming shower, I do not let you swoon but show my shadowy wings and sinewy power to lift you and not let you go. Upon the hills in white resplendence, upon the unstained meadows ground, in beautiful divine attendance, my fire shall strangely burn around. No, you, how frail is that delusion by which mankind is tricked? How small is that poor pitiful confusion that by wild passion's name we call? When shadows gather in the even and my enchantment senses you, 
you wish to fly aloft to heaven through fiery deserts of the blue. I gather you in my embraces and raise you up with me afar to where a star is like Earth's places and Earth's not different from a star. Then, stricken down with admiration, new universes you can see, sights unbelievable, creation made by my playful fantasy. In fear and strengthlessness you shiver. I hear you whisper, let me go. You, from my soft wings I deliver and smile upon you. Fly below. Beneath my smile divinely winning in an annihilating flight, like a cold stone you flutter spinning into the glittering void of night. And if you want to hear how that poem sounds in Russian, I posted the link. So how is that? I hope you understood that what will happen to you uh, in this class. I mean, I already see some people disappeared, right? Uh, they do not want to fall like a cold stone, but that's what you signed up for, correct? You can still, you can still quit, you know. How can counting, which even toddlers can perform on their fingers, create such strange experience? So let us begin to consider some appetizing examples. And I know I haven't explained a single thing about probability, but perhaps we already know just enough. So here is the first question, guys. And see, uh, you can text in the message or maybe speak up. You are invited to a household known to have two children. You have never seen these children and have no prior knowledge about them. As you park your car, you notice that one child is playing in the yard and that this child is a girl. Could you now tell me what is the probability that both children are girls? One over two, Professor. Uh huh. One over two. So uh, you say I, I see answers right now, like one half. And thank you, uh, Camille Zon. Uh, so I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. I'm yeah, sure. just Camille, Professor. Just Camille, Camille is nicer. Yes, easier. Yeah. Right? So a lot of people are saying one half, one half. Interesting. Some people say one quarter. Uh, are you ready, guys? And what's the answer? So you see, one of them is a girl. So the answer is none of you got it right. The answer is one third. Yeah, the answer is one third. Exactly, Albert. We have an Albert Einstein. I actually tried to call Minkowski. Minkowski said that Albert Einstein is a lazy swine. Sorry, Albert, uh, not, uh, not meant about you. You know, you're a great man. But Minkowski decided not to come. Minkowski was a mathematician that taught Albert Einstein, if you haven't figured out. Yes? So the answer is one third, guys. And now, why is the answer one third? The answer is one third for a very simple reason is that you have to know what is it that you are counting. Now, our universe consists of, in this situation, you can be reduced to only, um, to only the uh, vector girl, girl, boy, girl, boy, or uh, uh, girl, boy, you understand? So uh, you, you need to know what you are counting. So if you count uh, those three objects, each of them is equally likely. You see, you have assumed the answer is one half, perhaps because you assumed you know that the girl that you're looking at is the oldest child. Again, we have a lot of other assumptions. We have the binary gender assumption, which is a thing that we mentioned only in the recent years, yeah? Uh, and there is, of course, uh, the assumption that boys and girls are born uh, with equal probability, which is possibly not true. But uh, this problem is not interested in that uh, uh, aspect. It's really interested in your ability to count, right? What do you count? How do you count? Okay, so far one third, you all agree? The answer is uh, one third. Now we go to the next question. Very slight modification of uh, that next question, guys. And here it is. 
um, her mother comes to greet you and she is talking about something you don't really care about, but then she mentions this girl that you just saw was born on Wednesday. Yeah, she was born on Wednesday. Now, what is the probability that both children are girls? One quarter, some people, so Laura. Thank you, Lauren. One third, Nicholas. Joseph says one third. Come on, guys. It's a very interesting question. I just want to know what is your initial feeling about it. And by it, guys, and again, uh, you are around. Like I know somebody named Grant Tesla is there suddenly. So open your cameras, guys. I want to see your beautiful faces. I was deprived of society for such a long time. Well, good. Thank you, Anna. By the way, guys, I should mention that uh, I will start taking attendance soon. And in the attendance, I will mark uh, who is not just present. I will just take a photograph, right? Um, so I have my weird album. And in this album, if I don't see faces, you know, it's a significant statistical result. But what does it mean? Okay, so Gustavo says one half. One third, guys, okay. Uh, oh, if you're saying one half, one third, right? She was born on a Wednesday. It's not influential, that's not important, right? Well, the answer is, the answer is uh, 13 over 27. Exactly. Yeah. Now, what just happened here, guys? Well, what happened is that you don't know how to count. Now, what is this information that, uh, that was just mentioned to us? Uh, well, you think that uh, Wednesday is not an important information, but our universe has now grown bigger. We now know that, uh, that we have uh, days of the week in this universe, and we have girls in the universe and boys possibly. Yes, so what universe are we finding ourselves in? Well. I'm not finding myself in any good universe. I don't know about you guys. I'm finding myself in ever, ever worse universe. But in this situation, the universes are vectors of the form X, T, Y, S. Four vectors where X is the gender of the older girl. T is the day when she was born uh, or where he was born if it's a boy, right? This is the gender of the uh, of the younger child and the day this child was born. And now the evidence that we have is that we either witnessed a universe in which we have girl Wednesday as the older uh, girl born on Wednesday or universe of a type where the youngest child is a girl that was born on a Wednesday. Do you understand? Now, how many variabilities are in those vectors? So if you take the vector where I know, if I'm assuming that my uh, the child is uh, oldest girl, right? And then I have two variables here. So there are two possibilities here and seven possibilities here for a total of, for a total of 14 possibilities. And there are 14 possibilities in here. Now those universes are not entirely different. They can be, uh, intersecting at this one universe. It could be that both girls were maybe twins, maybe they were not twins, but born on Wednesday. Do you see what I'm talking about? Are you with me, guys? So you paid attention, but here is the problem. You don't pay attention to the unity, you paid attention to this. You're counting this, but you need to count universes as we will see very soon, okay? So, the answer is uh, that we have uh, 14 plus 14 universes and we have to subtract one because one universe we counted twice and therefore we get 27 possibilities. And each of those possibilities is assumed equally likely, which means that uh, uh, the possibility that both are girls, we now have to examine the situation. The universes in which both are girls is the universe where I know the, everything about the older girl. In other words, uh, I know the old, older child is a girl and born on Wednesday, but don't know when the younger child was born. Yes? 
And that gives me seven possibilities. Now doing the same thing symmetrically for the older child, that gives me another seven possibilities. And again, we overcounted this situation. So therefore there are 13 possibilities uh, um, that correspond to, uh, to having two girls. I'll account where you have two girls, yes? Isn't it interesting? So the answer is 13 over 27. That's the probability uh, given this information. Do you see how tricky it is uh, um, what we're doing here, right? And the trick is just knowing how and how you count what you have to count. Okay. Now let us uh, get closer to the situation that prevents us from meeting in person. Now tell me this, please. Consider a hypothetical scenario in which one out of 1,000 people has a disease, some disease, I don't know what it is. Now we have a test to figure out whether the person has a disease, whether they're very scared. Am I sick? They are very scared, so they go to get tested. And you have this test. This test has sensitivity equal to 100%. Impossible in real life. You know what sensitivity means, guys? Sensitivity means that if the disease is there, the test is sensitive enough to pick it. You follow? You understand? So in other words, given that the person is sick, the test will correctly reveal that the person is sick. That's uh, sensitivity, right? And specificity of 95%. Specificity meaning that maybe the person, uh, if the person does not have the disease, 95% of the time, there would not be a false positive. You know, it would say correctly, you don't have the disease. So sensitivity of 95%, uh, so, so specificity of 95% means that the test is not going to incorrectly uh, sound the alarm. Yes? So guys, if you take this test and the test came out to be positive, how worried should you be? How worried should you be that you have this disease? In other words, what's the probability? I'm not sure maybe you are a very sanguine and relaxed person, but what's the probability that you have the disease. Do you have a sense? I mean, I, I don't even want you necessarily to calculate, but do you think it's very high? Or do you think it's tremendously low? Or what, what do you, uh, what's your ballpark? You came up with a positive test. How afraid should you be? I think it's low. Okay, well, about how low? Uh, thank mm. you, Raida, for speaking. I don't have, I remember do, seeing a problem like this before where the result is a lot lower than you think it than you think. should be. Yes, well, I mean, we will learn how to do that uh, properly. I just want to see, uh, maybe it's low, maybe not. I'm not saying it's low. I mean, maybe you've seen something like that. Maybe it's not related to this problem. I would like you guys to give me um, maybe maybe a um, intuitive estimate. Like you get this result intuitively. What do you think is your probability, or, or, or what's your probability that you are sick? Just just throw me numbers. See what those numbers are. So Cindy says five percent. Uh, somebody gives me a kind of a very very accurate number. Okay, um, okay, interesting. So a lot of you say uh, one one person says one percent. All right, interesting. So the answer, guys, is I'm not going to explain right now why, 
the answer is 2%, more or less. It's, uh, the exact answer is 1 over 50.95. You can kind of uh, simplify the fraction. You can do it in your head if you know what to do in your head. And we will talk about it uh, when we uh, go and study conditional probability. As it happens, most medics, most medics estimate this probability to be very high. I mean, the one reason is, of course, they are afraid to be sued if they miss a disease. But the other reason is just, uh, is just, uh, well, I don't know. They they don't know probability too well, or uh, there is other maybe maybe there is other pressures in the United States for sure. There there is the if you if you accidentally do not locate the disease when it's there, you can be sued. You can be sued for malpractice, and of course, it's better to uh, for the doctor's um, legal stance to not. And risk it yes and to say oh you have to go and do stuff so always remember that guys uh, as in the united states people are hypochondriacs correct you know what a hypochondriac is so here is a, a more um interesting question right something that has to do with the censorship in fact right so you might have heard rumors right anybody knows anything about israel so by some accounts in Israel, 50% of COVID related hospitalizations are among uh, people that are fully vaccinated. It's estimated, I think um, crudely, that about 85% of the adult population in Israel is fully vaccinated against COVID, yes? Now, so a lot of people present this information and, and presented this information. And here you are as probability people, as mathematical people, you look at this evidence and do you, what do you think? Does it suggest the vaccine is actually working or does it suggest the vaccine is not working? What do you think? And don't worry about uh, telling me what you really think. Uh, don't we need to know the um, total percent of, I guess, number of patients that have COVID that were hospitalized and uh, not hospitalized? Let's say, let's say that we presented in a fraction, that's the information I'm giving, right? 50% uh, of COVID, uh, of basically, you go to a hospital, whatever, right? A hospital, and you see that 50% of the COVID patients are vaccinated. And the other 50 are obviously the non-vaccinated, right? So it's half and half. And you have the extra information that 85% of the population, of the adult population, children don't get sick of it, not really, uh, of the adult uh, population uh, uh, have taken uh, both uh, shots. They take Pfizer shots, essentially. So what do you think? Okay, Stephen, interesting. And Nicholas says, uh, uh, well, better is, is the point is just on, on li in light of this evidence, you understand? I'm presenting this evidence, I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm just saying, okay, here is this evidence. Does this evidence support that vaccines are not working or does it support that vaccines are working as the evidence is presented? So, so some people say it's working, but the efficiency is not high. Now, how high is the efficiency, guys? Let's look at it a little bit uh, closer. And uh, I'm not gonna explain the calculation uh, right now, because uh, again, it's better to do it when you know conditional probability. I'm just giving you uh, different flavors of uh, how people might perceive the information and uh, what the information actually says. And then I'll confuse you even further. So don't worry, right? If you once you feel you understand something, I will be sure that you don't feel this way ever. Okay, so here is uh, uh, here is um, I, I made the calculation, guys, myself based on that information, and uh, the calculation is that uh, if this is true, if it's true that exactly fifty percent of the population uh, in, in the hospital because of COVID 
is fully vaccinated and 85% of the population is vaccinated, then the vaccine is working at 85% efficiency. You understand? No, obviously you don't. I just see uh, some, some person that hopefully looks to you like he's smart. Do I look like you like you're smart? You better say yes, and I want to see 29 yeses right now. So because, well, I only see one, so I guess I failed you. Okay, too bad, too bad. Yeah, so don't be fooled by somebody that, that looks smart and might be very stupid, which is in fact what I am. So by my calculations, which I haven't revealed to you, it's 82% uh, effective. In other words, uh, if, you, if you might interpret it, that's the question is how do you interpret it, okay? That's the next question. So does, 82, uh, does the 82 estimate of vaccine efficiency suggest that getting the vaccine is the right choice? That's my next question, which is much more open-ended. What do you think? So Albert says yes, Ryan says yes. And a lot of you say yes, my dear indoctrinated students. Okay, so this is uh, what I would have said, at least uh, initially, right? So one dimensional analysis can only suggest optimizations in one direction, which are not globally optimizations at all. For instance, uh, if you do the same procedure and you examine blood thinners, right? You, you probably, I'm presuming, I'm not sure if that's true, but I'm presuming blood thinners, they prevent clots, correct? So you can show that taking blood clots will keep many people from hospital from blood clot related injuries, correct? So is the conclusion then that we should inject blood clotting agents so to just liquefy the blood into people that are 12, 13, 14, you know, and onwards to young people? Does that uh, the implication? Or if you do this one dimensional analysis at the more extreme case, guys, you know, if I came at you with a very great uh, cure, a plastic bag, you know, and I just do like this, like this, I just begin choking you with it, I will prevent 100% COVID related hospitalization, I promise you. You see? So understanding data is tremendously, tremendously difficult and tremendously difficult to. Uh, have uh, some amount of information and to analyze it and to reach a proper uh, solution, right? A proper solution. So if you are interested in uh, uh, such discussions, if you are, then uh, I highly suggest that you, uh, for instance, on YouTube, you can look at Ivor Cummings channel. It's a very interesting channel. And for instance, among other things, you can look at his eight minute, four minute summaries of certain uh, statistics. He's actually, uh, I think, uh, um, chemical engineer and uh, not, not a very, very clever guy, very good at analyzing data. And he also interviews very interesting people as for instance, Israel's, uh, well, he's actually, this guy is from all over the world, but he, um, you know, he is, um, he definitely speaks fluent Hebrew. Uh, so the Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Professor Michael Levitt and see what his data is on mortality um, because of COVID, right? Which by the way, is not reported well at all. So you look at the graphs and I, I see a lot of people say, well, how do you know the disease is very dangerous? They quote the um, Google statistics for how many people died of COVID. The problem with those statistics is that they don't have a background. They're absolute numbers. That's first problem. Second problem, they do not uh, display background mortality. How many people are supposed to die? How unusual is the situation? Have we faced similar situations? And if we have, then at what time? Do you understand? And the data is presented in such a way that it's tremendously difficult to uh, extricate, tremendously difficult to see um, uh, what's uh, true. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, here is, uh, so uh, Michael, uh, Professor Levitt received, uh, I think in 2013, 
uh, Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry. He is very, very good at mathematics and statistical analysis and data analysis. And I think uh, he had some computational models for proteins or something like that. So you can see what he thinks. You can uh, kind of look at his work on Twitter if you want. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, this is a very light read, uh, very interesting read and very light read is if you can, you can take COVID, why most of what you know is wrong by Sebastian Rushworth. And he is a Swedish doctor and uh, not very bad at statistics. Okay. Good. So uh, that's uh, my two cents for now. I hope you will read this book. Uh, I would be very glad if you do. Now uh, we can begin, I suppose, with uh, the basic principle of counting, right? We spoke about statistics. We see how misleading and how difficult it is to understand. And we need to begin with learning again how to count, okay? So the next part of the lecture is hopefully going to be initially easy and then tremendously difficult again. Oh, by the way, did I mention, guys, the video uh, is going to be posted on my YouTube channel, Arkady Etkin. That's what the name of the channel is. So if you want to rewatch it, uh, you know, you can do that there. I will just uh, create a playlist for you. With the with previous classes did the same. So here is uh, the basic principle of counting, guys. So we are going to flip a coin. A coin is uh, flipped and the results are supposedly only heads or tails. Good. So those are the universes that we have, only two universes. But if uh, we study this experiment where we flip both a coin and a die, then we have a vector. We have, uh, and I list this vector as first row and second row. You see that? So first row is uh, heads, and then we have all the, uh, the second uh, entrance is uh, the outcome on the die and tail. And then altogether, how many outcomes can we have for, for this experiment where we want to know both the result on the coin and the result on the die? 12. Well, obviously, but uh, but we are we are more interested in the general way of doing that. So suppose that we have it, it, we have our full procedure is divided into experiment one and experiment two, where for each outcome of experiment one, you have n outcomes and possible outcomes of experiment two. So for instance, if experiment one is flipping the coin and experiment two is flipping the die then experiment one has two outcomes and experiment two has six outcomes. Are you clear guys? So in the general setting, it's a very, very important thing to understand and understand intuitively. Uh, the general setting is uh, we have first experiment that has any number of M outcomes. And for each of those outcomes, the second experiment has any number of M outcomes. It, one of them will come out, clear? That's what I mean, one of those will come out. So. Uh, I can count them in the following way. I can place them in a matrix. So I can say uh, one, but then, then you have second is one, two, all the way to n possibilities, and then m, n possibilities. Altogether is n plus n plus n plus n, m times. So the answer is m multiplied by n. I hope you see that, guys, correct? You, you see what uh, you could count it in so many ways, but we're trying to create a system because it will become very quickly, very difficult to count. And you have to rely on those ideas. Right? So it's M times and here is an example, guys. Uh, suppose there are 10 women. Each woman has three children. And in the experiment, we will select a woman and one of her children. Do so you see what's happening here? So the woman, they can have, uh, they can be numbered one woman. So one woman is holding this uh, mug shot with the number one, the other one is with the number two, and then her children have numbers one through three. Yes. So the outcome of, uh, of this experiment is, of course, the second experiment has a different uh, type of outcome if we select woman one as opposed to woman two. Do you agree? But 
e, there are always the same number of outcomes. If I select woman one, there are three possible outcomes. If I select woman two, there are three possible outcomes. Yes? So it's not, not important that the outcomes are different, but it's very important that the outcomes are always the same in number. So here is the situation, right? Uh, and then uh, we can see, uh, I, I, I like guys, maybe because uh, of my affiliation with Germans, I like, I like to put it into a bureaucratic uh, piece of paper, which I will call Kafka protocol. Maybe you will read Kafka, uh, you would read uh, one of the novels, maybe the castle for instance, right? And you understand why I like to call uh, those things Kafka protocols. So in this protocol, I will, I will designate the result of the experiment by specifying which mother was selected and here which child was selected, yes? So you can see this box will contain a, 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 a numbers one through 10 and this box will contain numbers one through three. Altogether, there are clearly 30 possibilities, 30 such documents can be filed. If I file a document for each possible outcome, there are going to be 30 papers and I can count those 30 papers. You understand what I'm counting guys? I'm counting the documents, what I call Kafka protocols. Okay, now we need to generalize the basic principle of counting. So suppose we have all the way up to R experiments and each of them has a number of outcomes. They don't have to be the same, right? Now, this, this experiment has n sub one outcomes. This experiment has n sub two outcomes. The last experiment has n sub r outcomes. So we can, I mean, obviously you might, uh, you might right away tell me that uh, the number of outcomes is the product n one times n two times n three. Yes, you might already sense that to be the case that you just multiply the number of outcomes from experiment one times the number of outcomes from experiment two and onwards. But, just to be sure, let's try to uh, use the basic principle of counting with only two experiments to recursively solve this problem. So what I can think of is I can think of experiment one and experiment two here as I just, let's do it for three, right? This experiment one and experiment two, I think of it as a super experiment. Now, because the super experiment contains only two parts, I know that the product uh, is N1 times N2. You agree with me guys? Yes. If, if at any moment you feel stuck, don't be embarrassed. You tell me what it is. And after class, we always can stay and discuss anything that is still troubling. So the answer here is N1 times N2. Now, uh, this super experiment with experiment three, together it now again, I can apply the basic principle of counting. Now we have N1 times N2 possibilities. And here we have n sub three possibilities. So it's this number times this number, which gives us uh, the total number of outcomes. And in the same way, we can recursively solve for any finite number of experiments. Yes, you just group them by two, then add another one. You, you basically make a, a super experiment, a super, super experiment, a super, super, super experiment until you have covered all of them. And that's one way to recursively prove it. Good. So here is guys uh, um, another here is another, here is the uh, next uh, questions. Hopefully, still very simple one. How many different seven plate license plates are possible if the first three places are to be occupied by letters and the remaining four by numbers, right? I think how many letters are in the English language? I think 26, yes, 26, good. So the answer for this question is uh, very simple, but still I would like you to train to produce Kafka protocols. Also for the exam, it will help me quickly understand how you come around with your calculation. So here is the uh, Kafka protocol, very good, Ryder. So the Kafka protocol here is the boxes. So how many possibilities to fill in box one? 26 possibilities, 26 possibilities, 26 possibilities. And the remaining boxes we have from four to seven, from four to seven, we have uh, uh, four boxes left, correct? 
and there are 10 numbers. Then the numbers here can be zero through nine, zero through nine, that's the digits. So it's 26 to the power of three times 10 to the power of four. So far, so good, correct? No problem. Here is another question. How many functions defined on endpoints are possible if each functional value is either zero or one? So you understand? So, uh, so there is a function. You know how functions work. I mean, uh, uh, so endpoints, in other words, we have f of one, f of two, f of three, all the way to f of 10. And the value can either be zero or one for each input. How many possible functions can be defined? Uh, okay, I have two answers. Let's see if I have more guys. All right, wonderful. So uh, I have uh, the answer uh, two to the power of n. Now I can do that by again, drawing a Kafka protocol and one, the first box is the output of um, one. You know, basically if I, if I feel this full thing, if I feel this um, chart, then I know what this particular function is doing. So what is the number one? What's the digit one mapped into? It's mapped into either zero or one. So there are two possibilities. There are two possibilities for the next box, all the way to two possibility for, uh, for the last box. There are n boxes. So it's two times two times two. Two is multiplied by itself n times. Yes? So it's two to the power of n. Now uh, we go ahead and try to understand uh, how many permutations are possible on n objects. So permutation is uh, linear ordering. So what matters is you place, let's say students, you place them in line and how many ways there are distinct entities. So how many ways are there to place those distinct entities in linear order? So you can see that uh, I can imagine uh, grafting, on, uh, I can imagine drawing on the floor, the numbers one through N and labeling each student as one all the way to N. Do you agree? And then let me see how many ways to arrange them in order. So again, we do have the same Kafka protocol as before. Uh, we have uh, um, first place, second place, all the way to nth place. And here we fill in the particular student that occupies that place. Yes. So what do we get? Uh, we have for the first box, how many possibilities are there for the first box, guys? How many uh, possibilities for the first box? Um. Once this number is taken, the second uh, box, no matter what's the first number, as soon as I know the outcome of this experiment, there are n minus one outcomes for the next one, yes? So this one has n minus one possibilities. The next one has n minus two, all the way to the last one having only one possibility. You agree? So then by the generalized principle of counting, we multiply n by n minus one, by n minus two, by n minus three, all the way to one. And the result is called n factorial. You agree? So five times four times three times two times one is uh, five factorial. And that's how many ways there are to arrange five students by rank. First student, second student, third student. Good. So wonderful. That's this uh, box that I'm illustrating how it's done. And this is n factorial. So next question guys, and uh, I would like you to already do a Kafka protocol, even if you can solve it quickly, because the Kafka protocol will produce a sort of certainty that you are correct. You know, in a bureaucratic world, you are only correct if you have a document for it. And you should know that now. We're heading exactly into that world in the worst possible way. Okay, so here is my question. Class has six men and four women. Students are ranked according to their performance from best to worst. So first, A, how many different rankings are possible? 
So you understand we rank everybody together. That's very easy, right? So A is the easy situation. You can all type the solution in the box, the chat box. Very good. The answer is of course 10 factorial. Yes, because we have 10 individuals and there are 10 factorial ways of ranking them based on the principle of counting. Now guys, and I want you to justify it if you can. Ideally, maybe you, you would speak, but we'll see. So now, how many rankings if men are separate and women are separate? So they are not ranked uh, relative to each other, but you rank the men and you rank the women and you must present a report of, uh, of all the rankings together. Okay, interesting. Interesting. I already have uh, two slightly different solutions. You see, guys, protocol. All right. So, and another person wrote six factorial, four factorial. All right, guys. I will now reveal the solution. I know it's very little time, but it's always my fault. I always, uh, you know, I think I can't remember how to say it in English. I always delay and, uh, and then we have big congestion by the time we get to the end of the semester. So here is the Kafka protocol for the first uh, situation, but here is the Kafka protocol for the second situation. So your document, has to have a separate box for men and a separate box for women. You agree? Now, so we have uh, two experiments, the experiment in which we rank men and the independent experiment in which we rank women. Now, there are six factorial ways to uh, fill in this box and four factorial ways to fill in this box. Regardless of how you fill this box, there are four factorial ways to fill this box. So that is six factorial times four factorial. Do you see why guys? Because uh, to fill the full document, it's six factorial for the first experiment times four factorial for the uh, second experiment. And to figure out this, how many possibilities are there to complete first experiment, you subdivide it into sub experiments. And so you use the basic principle of counting recursively. Correct? If you write this document, one person already wrote multiplied by two. That was very interesting that somebody wrote multiplied by two. Now guys, uh, uh, multiplied by two means that I have to place women first and men second or uh, men first, women second, right? So in this situation, I would like you to uh, notice that six factorial times four factorial is equal to four factorial times six factorial, but the combinatorial procedure performed is very slightly different. It's like very slightly different. Like in Britain, you drive on the other side of the road. You know, we have opposite uh, uh, laws here. So in this form, uh, six factorial times four factorial means that on the left I have the men box, and on the left, on the right I have the woman box. And four factorial times six factorial means that I have a different document, a different form. So uh, you can produce, in fact, very interesting results to notice uh, equivalences between different counting procedures by coming up with different Kafka protocols that are both correct, but are doing the counting in a different way. And that's uh, something you train to do, you understand, guys? So when you present information on my exam, I love to see a Kafka protocol as it allows me to quicker, to much quicker figure out uh, how you we're carrying your calculation, what algorithm you were using. Now, here is uh, another question, guys. You wish to arrange 10 books on a shelf, four math books, three chemistry, two history, and one language book. So books on the same subject have to stay together. How many arrangements are possible? Let's see if you can calculate this one. Go ahead. <sighs> Oof. Be efficient, guys. Thank you. 
the class is over at uh, 650, correct? Okay. Even if you can solve this question, guys, uh, I want to see that you can solve it using Kafka protocol. So that in other words, you can solve it in a way that uh, with procedures that you can apply in more difficult situations. Right, guys, let's reveal the solution. Here is uh, how I decide to arrange it. So I first of all give code. So uh, math is coded as one, uh, chemistry is coded as two, and history is three, four is uh, languages. So those are the categories, right? So, uh, th so, so this is category one, category two, category three, category four. Okay, so I try to come up with an algorithm that describes what am I seeing when I look at my shelves. Okay, so I will see, first of all, in which order do I see categories as I go by the shelf from left to right. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Uh, this first category box will uh, tell me uh, which, cat which category I see first, second, third, fourth. So far clear? So then the, the math section will tell me Within the category of math, the orders, uh, the ordering of the books. Within the category of chemistry, what is the order of the books, and so on. So, for instance, uh, the code that I came up with looks something like two, four, one, three. So, what does two, four, one, three means? It two means that I first see uh, chemistry, right? So, I see chemistry first, and I see language afterwards, and then I see math uh, uh, in the third place and history as the last place. And this is the arrangement for math. That's within the math category, how the books are arranged within the um, chemistry category, how the books are arranged and so on. Yes. So if I read this code, I can translate and see what is actually I'm, what I'm actually able to view when I look at the shelf, correct? And if I see something on the shelves, I can translate it to a code. So that means that if I, if I have a one-to-one -one correspondence between actual outcomes and my calls, I am easily able to carry the calculation. I'm easily able to count. Do you understand? So because this document now, if I, if, if in this document, how many documents I can produce? Four factorial times four factorial times three factorial times two factorial times one factorial. Clear? So the answer is four factorial, four factorial, three factorial, two factorial, one factorial. You could have, if you gave me an answer that is not the same arrangement, that should mean that you, in your mind, had a different protocol, where maybe if, if the four factorial is at the end, then you mentioned category in your document as the very end. And we are done with this particular lecture, and let's move to dealing with overcounting. So how to deal with uh, overcounting. So suppose that uh, uh, some of the, uh, if we assign codes, some outcomes end up uh, looking alike to us. So for instance, suppose we have two white pawns and one pawn that's black. So I cannot distinguish between two white pawns, but I can distinguish between a white pawn and a black pawn. 
how many linear orderings are possible, distinguishable linear orderings are possible. Now, this is easy to do directly because you can see that I just focus on the black uh, pawn. Either the black pawn is the last pawn or it is the middle pawn or it is the first pawn. So they are all together exactly three possibilities. You understand? Now, it will be very difficult to count directly in most situations. So we need to come up with a code and sometimes the code we come up with is not in one-to-one -one correspondence with the actual events. Okay. So how are we going to do that? Well, we are going to label the first white pawn as one, the second white pawn as two, and the black pawn as three. Now, because they are now labeled as one, two, three, now they are distingu distingu distinguishable objects, you agree? So one, two, three is different from two, one, three. Even though, because the number is invisible, I cannot distinguish one, two, three, and two, one, three. You agree? So if I type in my documents, guys, if I type my documents, uh, then uh, I see that uh, I see that they are going to be uh, three factorial or six documents, uh, which are just arrangements of the pawns in linear order, where it's one, two, three, two, one, three, and everything like that, right? Now, two of those documents, the document one, two, three, and the document uh, uh, one, uh, the document one, two, three, and the document two, one, three, they represent the same outcome. They represent white, white, black. So those uh, codes are uh, synonymous and they refer to the same object. So what I do, I staple them together. So the, the two documents, I staple them together. I have one event. You understand? Now, the situation where I have uh, white, black, white, it has also two outcomes. The outcomes are, you see, if black is in the middle, that means three is in the middle, but I can change always one and two. Changing one and two does not create a different, uh, a distinguishable, a visibly distinguishable outcome, correct? So again, we have two documents and again, we have two documents. Now, because synonyms, guys, because uh, uh, we have the same number of synonyms for each actual object, we can actually easily obtain uh, uh, the number of objects from the total number of words. You understand? So words are the codes. I have six codes and uh, for each actual outcome, two codes represent that actual outcome. So what I do is I take six divided by two. You understand why? Because what I count are the, uh, are the I, can, I can just place them in piles. You see, I can place uh, uh, two paper thick piles. There is the pile corresponding to white, white, black. This pile contains document one and document two. The pile corresponding to white, black, white corresponds to document three and document four. So I place them as separate, uh, as separate uh, pile. So instead of counting codes, I count piles. And how can I do that, guys? Uh, the number of piles multiplied by the number of documents in each pile equals to the number of documents. So then if I take the number of documents and divide by the number of piles, I get the number of objects. Are you with me? I know I say document pile and I think some of you are spacing out. I see some of you already are falling like cold stones. Do you understand? Uh, write uh, yes or something or write no. Okay, so far good. Here is guys, here is uh, the analysis again summarized. You, you see, human language, it's a bit more difficult, right? So some nouns have uh, many synonyms, you know, some uh, objects have many synonyms, others don't have as many, right? So for instance, uh, you take snow, I'm not sure how many other words are there for snow, but some things have uh, many words that mean the same thing. Uh, if it happens that uh, uh, you have uh, each, each actual uh, distinguishable object has the same number of words referring to it, then it's easy to know how many different objects we have by knowing how many words there are in total. Okay, so in this case, it, it means 
number of piles times number per pile, because the number per each pile is the same, equals to number of documents. So distinguishable outcomes equals to number of piles, which are documents divided by the count uh, in each document. Are you with me? So this is the synonyms. This is the document, uh, number of documents divided by uh, total codes that correspond to the same uh, pile, to the same object. Here is uh, a, a more difficult example, and we are going to try to analyze it very carefully. So we have six pawns, and uh, the ones that look alike are indistinguishable. Good. So we can form, uh, first of all, we can imagine assigning numbers to them. So this is one, two, three, et cetera. They are assigned numbers to make them distinguishable. And then I can place those numbers in here. And I have six factorial different ways of arranging them once numbers aside. But many of those arrangements are not corresponding to distinguishable outcomes, right? This is an overcounting. So for example, one, two, three, four, five, six is the same as two, one, three, four, five, six. Do you agree? Because if I change one and two, I do not see any difference. Mm -hmm. They, they are exactly alike, they are twins. So uh, how many of those codes refer to the same outcome? Well, how many codes refer to the outcome WWBRRR? Okay, so we can do that intuitively well. Uh, WW, I can permute uh, the whites among themselves and I can permute the blacks among themselves and the reds among themselves. How many permutations are there? Two factorial, one factorial, three factorial. Right, which means that when I permute, I change the orderings of one, two, three, four, five, six. So it means that two factorial times one factorial times three factorial is the number of rearrangements of each uh, uh, of uh, of each distingu of distinguishable pattern. So it means that six factorial divided by this number will give you the number of distinguishable patterns. That was a very quick analysis. I'm going to actually go back to it and be a little slower. Hopefully that's for a useful purpose. Okay, here is the same procedure, but done with, with greater care in hopes that you understand uh, how careful you must be. So imagine that uh, each of those pawns has to carry two IDs. It has to carry a population ID, which is a number between one and six, and it has to, uh, it has to carry a color ID, which is, uh, which is, let's say, one and two means white pawn, uh, right? Uh, it means the first white pawn, second white pawn. If it's a black pawn, the number one means uh, first uh, black pawn. If it's, an, if it's a red pawn, it might have another color ID, which is one, two, and three, right? So two numbers, right? Population number and second number will indicate its, uh, its ranking within the uh, within the particular uh, group of identical individuals. So then I can uh, create a document to count how many uh, ways to arrange white, white, uh, black, red, 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 right? So if the pattern that I see is white, white, black, red, 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 uh, how many ways can I see the pattern? Here is that uh, protocol again. So white, I'm just looking at the at, at the colors of uh, white among themselves, and I see. Do I see when I when wherever it's located? Do I first see uh, white number one and then white number two, or do I first see white number two and then white number one? You follow what I'm saying? So within a particular pattern, uh, uh, within a particular pattern, like within this pattern, do I first see uh, green one or do I first see green two? Do I, within the red, do I first see green one, two, three, or, or just within the red? Or do I see uh, do I see red two, then red three, then red one? So that's what, what this document refers to, right? With this label. So if I see this pattern, just uh, uh, scan it and find the relative position of whites to themselves, blacks to themselves, reds to themselves. How many arrangements there are? Two factorial times one factorial times three factorial arrangements. If I change this label by any other label, this document remains the same. So any arrangement has the same number of synonyms. You understand what I'm saying? This, uh, this white, white, black, red, 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 I can just change by any other distinguishable arrangement and I still have the same document because I can still 
uh, look at the relative position of whites, relative position of black, relative position of red. So that implies yet again, we have the same number of synonyms for each distinguishable outcome, the same number of codes, which means we can carry out this procedure. We can take six factorial and divide by two factorial, one factorial, three factorial to obtain the correct uh, answer. You understand, guys, what I do when I divide? The number on the, on the basically, I imagine taking the six factorial documents and grouping the documents into piles. Uh, if, and, and two documents are in the same pile, if they, uh, the code uh, refers to the same outcome. You understand? So for instance, uh, uh, for instance, the outcome white, white, uh, black, red, 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 will have the document in which, uh, in which we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we do have also the document in which we see two, one, uh, three, four, five, six, seven numbers. Good. I hope it's clear, guys, and I hope it's not just clear, but because you have an intuition for it, but it's clear that you can create a, a Kafka protocol and prove your, um, to prove that you are correct. Here is uh, another problem. How many rearrangements of the word necessary are there? Right, so you can look at it. Uh, necessary, I can I cannot distinguish between the ends. I cannot distinguish between C's or E's or S's or A's or R, or R's or Y's. Right, so I, if I just label them, I see uh, how many ends I have, how many E's I have, C's, uh, S's, A's, R's, and Y's. Altogether, I have nine uh, possible uh, letters. So it's nine factorial divided by rearrangements of those letters among themselves, and this refers to the size of the pile of documents that uh, all those documents describe the same arrangement, the same word. I hope you understand that, guys. It's tremendously important and very, very urgent to understand that. We cannot uh, delay. Good. All right, so here, uh, another example. 10 competitors, four Russian, three United States, two British, one Brazilian. How many outcomes are possible if we have to describe uh, their, um, if basically after the competition, you just describe them by country. Let's say uh, Russia first, Russia second, Russia third, and everybody else uh, afterwards, right? So tell me uh, how many uh, um, how many different outcomes are possible. Okay. Okay, so this is the situation, guys. You see, uh, if we have uh, this outcome, again, if we, if we list them as one, two, three, four, all the way to 10, it could be, this is, this is the possible outcome that we can have. Altogether, we have 10 individuals, so that 10 factorial, uh, ways of arranging them, but some individuals cannot be distinguished, which means uh, there are four factorial, three factorial, two factorial, one factorial um, ways of placing uh, uh, the same categories. Good. You understand why it's this number, guys, right? This is the number of synonyms because I cannot distinguish uh, among the R's. If this is the situation, then uh, permuting the R's among themselves gives me four factorial different uh, codes for R. Permuting U's among themselves gives me three factorial U's 
uh, arrangements of U's and onwards, you see? So uh, this uh, is the number of uh, calls that mean the same thing. And in general, if uh, we have n objects of which n1 are alike and two are alike, all the way to nk being alike, n factorial over the product of n1 factorial all the way to nk factorial represents the number of outcomes uh, that are distinguishable. Good? Everything's clear, guys? So. I hope I covered enough. I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not racing too much because uh, there's quite a lot to talk about and I uh, never find the full time to talk about uh, advanced materials as I tend to spend a lot of time in the elementary developments. So, all right, guys, thank you for staying. You were great. I enjoyed seeing your faces. If you want to stay after class and have questions for me and talk to me, interact with me, then please do so. Otherwise, Goodbye. I hope that uh, as, 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 since I'm trying to keep my location invisible, I mean, I'm going to be somewhere else on this week and I'm uh, next week. So hopefully uh, the internet works very well. I'll let you know if not, but uh, mostly. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. All right, I'm stopping the recording.